Amen. Thank you very much. There should, if there is, I just want to echo that beautiful song, anyone in despair, Jesus is always waiting, always waiting. There is nothing you can do that he can love you less. Nothing. And nothing you can do that he can love you more. His love is eternal, the same all the time. All the time. In Acts chapter 1, I invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We're going to continue where we left off last week. Do we remember what we talked about last week? For those that were here. We, were, we, we based our message on John 17 and Jesus' last prayer. But it was... What was the main point? What is God's last request when he prayed for the church? Oneness, loving one another. The church just get along. So today's message has to has a question, what does God do when his children don't get along? I thought about I thought about combining it last week, but I didn't want to go too long. So I wanted just talk about this morning what does God do when his children who profess to be Christians just don't get along let's pray father in heaven we thank you so much because in your word is wisdom and your word is truth and your word is what we need in every single aspect of our lives open our hearts Take away any distractions. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews. By the who? Yes. By the Hellenists, which, which are, are Greeks that's, that have turned Jews, Greek-speaking Jews, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So here we can see that, number one, the church was multiplying. That when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint. There arose a complaint. Friends, it's a fact. It's a known fact. The more people you have, the more problems you have. Not just at church, but even in a work setting. The more employees you have, the more problems you have to deal with, the more things the more people's attitudes, the more issues you put up with. The more people, the more issues that you have. And so here at the church was growing, there arose a complaint. There arose a complaint. So what does God do when his people don't get along? What does God do when two spouses don't get along? Or two siblings don't get along. Or two neighbors don't get along. Or two deacons or two deaconess or two elders don't get along. What does he do? Especially when those people who call themselves Christians are not getting along. The Holy Spirit is trying to get people to get along in the church and sometimes we resist. Sometimes we resist. I want to just plant a little seed right now. Plant a little seed. If you are one of those types of persons that sees it as the other person's fault whenever you are in a discussion, you have a problem. I'll repeat that. If you are one of those persons that whenever you're discussing or not getting along with someone, sees it as their problem, they're at fault, you have a problem. 
Amen. I'll say amen for you. And to be more clear, if you are that type of person that sees it, that it's always their fault and they're, they're wrong, you are the problem. You are the problem. By the time we get to chapter 6 in the book of Acts, much has happened in the church. A lot has happened in the church. And the devil pulls out the same old trick that he's done from the very beginning here in Acts chapter 6. And I want to show you that old trick that the devil still is pulling out even today among his church. Genesis chapter 2. If you join me, what the devil did to bring disunity, he started at the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. The devil doesn't have to reinvent anything else because we keep falling for the same old trick. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Here it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you sh you may eat, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There's God's command. But notice there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, now the Satan is talking, the serpent. And notice what, what, what seed the serpent plants. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? We know for sure, we just read, that's not what God said. And Eve, she knew what God had said. But Eve then says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor you shall touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent says, Surely you will not die. Surely you will not die. The devil, be, besides bringing doubt to the word of God, he's questioning God's intentions for Adam and Eve. There, because there we know the story where Satan says, in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God. The devil is keeping something from you. And he begins to question God's intention for man. And unfortunately, Eve fell for that. And so did Adam. This harmony, this harmony with people starts with this harmony with God. They began to doubt God's word. Well, maybe the serpent is right. Maybe God, they began to doubt the clear command that God had said. And when they begin to doubt God, when you begin to doubt God, there, this harmony begins between you and God. And when this harmony begins between you and God, then this harmony continues with you and others. And we can see it there. There where, where Adam and Eve, where God comes to Adam and asks him, where are you? And he says that he was hiding because he was naked. And then what did God say? Did you eat of the fruit? And what did Adam say? Here it is in verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have, I, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. You see how you have the, the disharmony with Adam and Eve? No, thank God <laughs> that there was no pots or skillets there in the garden because Eve would have thrown one to Adam trying to blame it all on her. <coughs> this harmony with God continues with this harmony with each other. You show me a person that doesn't get along with somebody else, you're looking at a person that doesn't get along with God. 
a person that can't get along with somebody else, there's an issue that they have with God. It may not be clear, but there is an issue that they have with God. Did Jesus get along with everyone? They may not have gotten along with him, but he got along with every single one. Even at the cross, he forgave them and was able to get along. Because he got along with his father, he was able to get along with others. This harmony in the church comes when people separate themselves from God. When you spend time with Jesus, he helps you to get along with others. But the most important thing is that when you spend time with Jesus, friends, he reminds you of the sinner that you are. He reminds you that you're not any better than the person you can't get along with. And in reality, you're both in the same boat. So he reminds you, how can I even criticize the other person or not get along with them when I'm just like them? Sinner, wretched, naked, and blind, the Bible says. And so that helps us as we get along with Jesus and learn more about him. Lord, I can't be angry at such and such brother. I'm, we're just as same sinners, needing a savior like you. Needing a savior like you. I'm not perfect myself, so how can I expect perfection from somebody else? All through the Bible, God's people have always found a reason not to get along. Whenever God's people begin to get along, Satan pulls out the old trick. He begins to question the intentions of others. He plants, he, he plants that seed in you questioning about other person's intentions. About other person's intentions. Someone may say something about you, but because you are insecure of yourself and haven't spent enough time with Jesus, you make a little comment into a big hill, into a big mountain. And it is the same thing when we get to the book of Acts. Here in the book of Acts, if we go back to the book of Acts, he says, I'll get the Greeks to complain against the Jews. I'll just get the Greeks to complain against the Jews. So Satan does this, and what is the main purpose? Because Satan likes this unity. There's a reason behind this unity. You see, he almost pulled this off with the disciples. Almost pulled it off. After the resurrection, when Jesus went to go see them, if you read there the last chapters of, of John, the disciples are out fishing again. Jesus is, is, and, Je and Jesus goes to them, what are you doing fishing? You're supposed to be fishers of men, not of fish. And he encourages them. The main reason why Satan brings this harmony, this unity, is because he, he knows that that will stop the work. He knows that this harmony will stop the work. This unity will stop the work. Confusion, not getting along, will stop the work. And that's his main goal. That's all he wants, is people to stop the work of God. If he can get, to stop the, he, if he can get the work to stop, he'll be happy. He'll be happy. In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 are baptized. Acts chapter 4, 5,000 are baptized. In Acts chapter 5, you read there that multitudes were added and added. And what Satan really hates, if you go to the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts 2, verse 41. The church is growing. 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, just to keep adding and adding. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, Then those who gladly received his words were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Notice verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayer. Verse 44. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Are you seeing the unity? 
and sold their possessions and goods and divided among all as anyone had need. So continually, verse 46, so continuing daily with what kind of accord? One accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. And simplicity of heart. There in one accord, all things in common. And that is what the devil is scared of. Whenever the church is united in one accord, it begins to grow and grow. All the doctrine, as true as it may be, friends, will not keep people in the church. We can preach the truth of the Bible, the truth of the Sabbath, the, the truth of the state of the dead, the truth of heaven, the truth of the ministry of Jesus in heaven, the truth about hell. But if somebody comes to church and just is always criticized, no one likes them, just cannot get along with them, even though the truth is here, it's hard to stick around. It's hard to stick around. All the truth, as true as it may be, will not keep people in the church, but we need to get along with each other. And that's why Jesus' last prayer request was that they may be one. People are looking today for real Christians, friends. For real Christians. And somewhere between chapter 2 in the book of Acts through chapter 6, the distribution, someone said, let the Jews go first and then the Greeks. And because of that little decision, there in Acts chapter 6, there was a complaint. And it began a complaint. Because someone decided, you know, why don't we distribute it first to the Jews and then to the Greeks? Without even knowing the intentions. But just, they, 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 they didn't like the order and they began a complaint. They began a complaint. What kind of little stuff do we do to create this harmony, friends? Think about, now let's think about our church context here. What kind of little things? Now we don't distribute things how they did here, but what other things? Little things may happen that we let it create this harmony. Maybe, maybe somebody's singing and we may say, you know, you know, that person sings very well, but do they have to sing all the time? You're planting the seed to bring this disharmony. Oh, you know, that brother does make lots of money. They should help the church. But, fill in the blank. They, there's a criticism. Are you the type of person that you cannot give full credit to somebody else? You know, we should say that that person sings great. Period. Thank you. That person, that person tells great children's stories. Praise the Lord. Period. No little planting seeds. But, does it always have to be about puppies? <laughs> Don't change your method. I love a good puppy story. But there's that little seed planting. Oh, the potlucks are good, but... And those little buts bring disharmony because you're spreading the seed to somebody else and maybe that's, that's somebody else. Oh, you know, you're right. And there it goes. Rippling. Bringing disharmony. Bringing disharmony. Just as Satan had placed in Eve doubt about God's intentions, he places in the Greeks minds about the Jews' intention. The Jews' intentions. Here, the Greeks are complaining that the widows are being neglected. This harmony among believers does more than produce confusion, friends. It produces paralysis. That's a fancy word for paralyzed. 
It produces stillness. When a marriage is not getting along, the whole family is paralyzed. It's not just the spouses. The whole, it affects the whole family. When, if you have a company and you have people not getting along, somewhere along the production, it affects the whole, the whole thing. I, rem I remember when I used to work at Walmart and there was times when I would go and help in the back unload the trucks that came in every single evening at, at 4 o'clock. And you had that line with the little wheels that you unrolled everything. And there had to be somebody way inside in the hot truck, because they're hot, unloading. Sometimes there would be complaints. Hey, it's not my turn. And then we're over here waiting for the merchandise to come, but there's complaints over there. It, it, it paralyzes the whole production line. Or the other way around. They're unloading quickly, quickly, quickly. And then we're over here unloading into each department. And sometimes they say, no, 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 I want that department. No, no, you take care of that department. And the merchandise starts to pile up. And because there's, there's disagreement here, it paralyzes the whole production. And it can happen the same way in church. Little complaints here and here and here and there and there paralyzes the whole church and the work of the church and the work of the church. <coughs> it's surprising on how much energy it takes not to speak to someone. It's surprising, friends. Especially if you live with that someone. <laughs> Trying not to speak with your spouse because you're in disagreement and you live with that person. It's, it's dumb, that's what it is. And it's the same way at church. That's why, that's why the devil knows that if he can bring, like I mentioned last Sabbath, disunity, the church won't work. The church won't care about winning souls. The church won't care about retaining the souls that are already here. If the devil can get the pastor or pastors to be busy putting out fires in the church, he's happy. He's happy. Just like in the, in, in the meditation in the back, the, the, the same one that I read to you last week, and I, it is so inspiring, so great that I want to share, with, share, with it, share, share it again. It's from Acts of the Apostles, page 87. The heart of those who had been converted under the labors of the apostles were softened and united by Christian love. Despite former prejudices, all were in harmony with one another. Satan knew that so long as this union continued to exist, he would be powerless to check the progress of gospel truths and he sought to take advantage of former habits of thoughts in the hopes that thereby he might be able to introduce into the church elements of this union. Satan knew that so long as this union continued to exist he would be powerless. He would be what? Powerless. powerless. When you are getting along in church, the devil is powerless. When you are getting along at home, the devil is powerless. So then, I haven't really answered the question, what does God do when his people don't get along? Go back to the book of Acts chapter 6. We're going to see what he does. Acts chapter 6. Verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitudes of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. When we can't stop the word of God to settle arguments, is what he's saying. And the devil really enjoys if the pastor is too busy settling arguments of brothers and sisters who say they're Christians but yet can't get along. So what does he do? 
when the church is not getting along. There in verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. What does he do? He calls the church back to the mission. He appoints others to take care of it. He appoints others to take care of it. He puts people to work. He puts people to work. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. What was this business? The argument between the Jew and the Greek and the distribution and the widows. The apostle says, we can't deal with that. Appoint others to take care of it. And that's exactly what they did. In church, let me tell you why the Cleburne church is not yet the church it can be. The Cleburne first, this church right here that I love so much. Why isn't it the church that it can be? Because we still have too few people carrying the whole load. Too few people are carrying most of the load of the church. That's why. We have an average attendance, I get it every week, of 240, 230, sometimes 250, sometimes 280, oh, it's over 200. And yet, the load is still carried on a handful of people. And we need to distribute the load. Now, we've tried this distributing the load. The problem is, people are like, no, we'll let so-and-so who's always done it all this time, let us them continue doing it. God tells Peter to distribute the load. And this is where it gets genius. Notice verse 5 in Acts chapter 6. Who does he distribute the load to? I've read, this, I've read this over and over and over, but notice here, verse 5. And, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. They liked the idea. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of, and of, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and who else? Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon or Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, who was he? A proselyte, a proselyte. Do you know what a proselyte is? A convert to Judaism, a convert. That means he wasn't a Hebrew, he wasn't a Jew. Most likely he was a Greek because it says from Antioch. And if you, look, and if, if you look at Antioch, Greeks lived in Antioch. So Nicholas was probably, most likely, a Greek. What was the beginning, what was the, what, what was the beginning complaint? There, the, there were a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. The Hellenists are Greek-speaking Jews. And what, does, what, does, what is the solution? Well, let's put them to work. The Greeks are complaining. And what does Luke tell us here? We'll put the Greeks to work. We'll put the Greeks to work. Do you get the solution that God is doing here? For people who don't get along, God's solution for complainers is to put them to work. God's solution for the Greeks here, when they were complaining, he says, put him to work. Put, put him in charge of distributing them. If he's complaining about the distribution of how we are distributing, then put him in the group of being in charge then. If you don't like what's going on, friends, in the Cleburne Church, be quiet and get to work. <laughs> if you don't like some of the things that the board is doing, 
be quiet, join a ministry and become part of the board and your voice can be heard and maybe then it can run better. Stop fussing, but just roll up your sleeve and volunteer to a ministry. Volunteer and do something. And do something. What does God do when his saints don't get along? He puts them to work. Because when you don't work, friends, when you don't work, all you do is sit. And when you sit, you see. And when you see all the time, you begin to pick at things because you got nothing to do. You're not volunteering in any ministry. No one's asked you to do anything. Or maybe they might have asked you, but you keep saying no. So all you do in the church service or in fellowship lunch or in Sabbath school is sit and look and get little things and complain and share them with others. Instead of doing that, friends, get involved. Get involved in a ministry. If there isn't a ministry that that, that, that you like, that you have a passion for, here's a genius idea. Create one. Just create one. I really want to praise the Lord for Jeannie who likes sewing and knitting. I mean, we didn't have a ministry like that here. But she came to me and says, can we start doing that? Of course you can. And now they've Praise the Lord, they've given things to students to take home as gifts. They've given to the whole patients sweaters and, and, and uh, blankets and baby clothes and hats. It's a ministry growing. They meet, every, I don't want to say every Sunday, but they, they meet on Sundays here in the, in the, fellow, in the FLC. Family Life Center, thank you. They meet there on Sundays working a ministry. Friends, look at the result when they put the complainers to work in verse 7. The complaint started, the devil thought he almost had the, 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 the church at a pause from working the gospel. But then they put them to work, they put the same Greeks to work, and notice verse 7. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Their work continued to grow. The work continued to grow. When God's people can't get along, God says put them to work and their complaining will stop. Because then you won't have time to complain. If you're too busy organizing your ministry, organizing volunteering, organizing something in the church, working with the deacons, with the deaconess, with the hope clinic, with the school, in one way or another. When God's people don't get along, what does God do? He puts them to work. Friends, this year we are electing and re-electing our board members. We are having nominating committee this year. And some of you will be re-elected. Some of you will be asked, maybe for the first time, to hold up a position. Don't worry that you are not capable of doing it. Please, don't worry about that. I can tell you right now. And you know, because when I was asked to be your pastor, I was not capable of doing it. But God will give you the wisdom, the grace, and support of others to continue on ahead. It is not by your power that you do things. It is by God's grace and God's will that he helps you to do it, friends. That he helps you to do it. So I want to appeal to you to join a ministry. If there isn't one that you like, start a ministry. There isn't, there isn't a reason why. If there isn't space for the ministry that, that you would like, well, we'll figure something out. Let's, let's come together and think and brainstorm. So don't give up. If sewing isn't your thing, 
if the Hope Clinic isn't your thing or the school, but something else may be, then let's come, as the Bible says, and reason together and work together. This church cannot be run by the same group of people year after year after year after year after year. Because eventually those same people will get old, may get sick, and will pass away. And then what? Friends, the church, I'm glad that Forrest brought the little children here to get used to being up in the platform. But I just appeal to you, church. Join a ministry. Join something in the church. Or start a ministry, friends. Or start a ministry. That is my appeal. As God last prayer request was that his church may be one. And the only way to be one is not to be isolated alone in your own little corner. No. But to be working with others. I know Sabbath school could use help. I know deacons can you help. Deaconess, I, every single department. Pathfinders can you help. Adventures can you help. There are so many things to do here at Church Friends. So many things. So I just appeal to your heart to let yourself be used. You don't know how to do it? You can learn. There's no problem with that. You're smart people. You are smart people because you come to the Cleveland Church. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Church, may God bless you. And may God touch your heart. As, as this year we, we have our, our nominating committee and ministries and, and choose our leaders and assistants and officers that you may consider in working for the church. There are so many things. I'm looking at Alvin and the sound can... There's so many things. I can go on and on. There's so many things, friends. May God bless you. And may you, this year, pro purpose in your heart, I will not just sit around anymore, but I will do something for God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we are your church. We don't want to... We don't want to begin to dispute or begin to argue. We don't want the, your work to stop here in Cleburne. But I need, Lord, that you help every single one of these people. That you convert every single one of us and that you convince every single one of us to work for you in one way or another. There are so many things to do that we can grow your kingdom. We can share your love to others. And I just ask that you place in every single one here a heart to serve you. That we may be one in working for you. Just as you, just as you have said, this is my commandment, that we love one another. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.